Hi, everyone. Welcome to How to Eat Something from Your Garden Every Day with Henry Homeyer at NOFA New Hampshire's 20th Annual Winter Conference. I'm Laura Andrews, NOFA New Hampshire's Program Coordinator, and I'll be hosting this session with Amy Antonucci, uh, NOFA New Hampshire Education Committee member. Um, first, please note that we are recording this session and all sessions throughout the conference, and we'll share the recordings with you at the end of the week. Um, everyone will be muted during the workshop, so please type your questions into the chat box throughout the discussion, um, and then I will read them out when we get to the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, for technical issues, please feel free to communicate publicly through the chat or message me or Amy privately, um, and you can reach me at Laura or the NOFA New Hampshire one will also go to me. Um, and if you'd like to access closed captioning, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click the arrow on the CC icon, and then click show subtitle. And if you're watching in a smaller screen, it might be under three buttons um, that say more uh, or that says more, um, and then click show sub the show subtitle option. Um, and before I get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this conference is taking place on the land of the Penacook tribe or Indakana, the Abenaki word for the tra traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples past and present. And we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the Alnobak or people who have stewarded this land through the generations. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Henry Homeyer, garden writer and columnist. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Cornish Flat, New Hampshire. And I know that some of you would probably like to be out on your skis or snowshoes today, but uh, we've got an hour here to talk about growing food. And uh, I have a lot to say and some, some photos to share. Just briefly, uh, I, I write for a dozen newspapers around New England every week. Uh, locally here in New Hampshire, there's the Hippo, uh, the Concord Monitor, the Valley News, Bridge Weekly, and during the summer, the Laconia uh, Daily Sun. Uh, I have papers in Vermont and uh, one big one in Rhode Island that covers the state. I've written four gardening books, and at the end of this, I will have information on my screen how you can order one of my books that I'm selling directly to you, uh, or you can get it from my website, uh, which is gardening-guy.com, but that'll all be at the, on, on screens at the very end. So I grew up an organic gardener. My grandfather, John Lennox, lived in uh, Spencer, Massachusetts, and as a young boy, uh, I spent time with him. and. Uh, after my grandma died when I was eight, I spent part of every summer with Grampy, and um, he taught me a lot just by doing things. You know, he'd build a compost pile, and I'd watch how he did it, and I would dig in it for worms to go fishing, and, and did lots of little things, but he never forced me to garden, which made me love gardening. And um, I bought my house here in Cornish Flat over 50 years ago. I'm an old geezer, as you can probably tell from the pictures. Uh, and I've been uh, growing my own food on it for a long time. My soil is wonderful. It's river bottom to start with. So it's always moist and it's full of a very high organic matter. So I do very well with my garden. And I made it my, one of my life goals is to mess around with the, the statistic that says every a bit of food on your table travels an average of 1500 miles from where it was grown to your plate. So I try to have things from my, on my plate that I grew or that farmers in my neighborhood or in my region grew. I don't grow meat, but I eat meat. So I, I buy locally. Uh, I, I buy directly from the farmer when I can, either at farmer's market or at the farm. That's one way that we can support our organic farmers. I also eat seasonally. I like to eat food when it's fresh and good. And um, I've learned how to store food. So for example, I can have fresh edible potatoes in my cold cellar eight or 10 months a year. 
so for the two months that they're growing out in the garden and they're not ready to harvest, I don't eat potatoes. I went 20 years once without ever buying a potato because I saved the potatoes from this year's harvest to start next year's plantings. Um, it's fun. I enjoy it. You don't have to do that. But let's get started. And I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see what's going on here. Share screen. All right, Laura, give me some advice here. I'm clicking on share screen and I'm getting. I'm not getting. It should bring up options of which screen to share like a little window should oh pop okay up. and then you have to there we go one. there you go all right and then you said from there i should put uh the one to the right just to the right yeah there you okay. go so here's a little garden it's at 10 feet by 12 feet in the middle of the lawn i built this for two elderly women in cornish flat and I said, you know, we can grow a lot of food if you'll give up a little bit of your lawn. So they agreed that they would. And if you look here, you can see that there's a, a big squash plant. That's a Romanesco squash, which is a great keeper. And the, the, one of the great things about it is that it can get big and it doesn't get, get, doesn't get woody. Back here, you got two tomatoes. There's a bean trellis with pole beans. Over here, we've got five or six potato plants. We had lettuce growing underneath the tomatoes when they were young and then they got shaded out or they got eaten up, but they would be shaded out. Uh, there were a couple of broccoli, a couple of peppers. Now you say, well, a little garden like this is great for eating, but you can't save anything. It's not true, actually. Um, small raised beds, gardens like this can produce a lot of food. Here's a sun gold tomato that um, this, this and a single individual plant can grow, can grow just tons of tomatoes. I, I have never counted them all, but I can put a couple hundred in a, in a Ziploc bag and uh, put it in the freezer, or I can dehydrate them. It's really up to you. And when you're thinking about what you want to do for a garden, it's important to think about how much time do you have? How much space do you have? What do you like to eat? And do you want to eat it all year? If you want to eat it all year, there are a number of different techniques. You can store it, as I did with my potatoes, and we'll talk about that. You can freeze it. You can dehydrate it. Uh, those are the three big ways of storing food that I do. You can also can things, though I don't do that very much because it's, it's a long process with lots of work and lots of energy from my stove to do that. So let's start off by talking about um, storing. Different, different vegetables need different conditions. So in my cellar, which is a, an above ground cellar, it stays between 35 and 50 degrees from fall to spring. And this is perfect for storing potatoes, carrots, kohlrabi, celeriac, rutabagas, parsnips, and turnips. There's some things to consider when you're storing your vegetables. So these all like plenty of humidity and just by the nature of it being in a cellar that the humidity is fine. You've also got to think about mice and rats because they love potatoes and carrots, less so the other things there. Um, but if you have an old refrigerator, um, it works very well for storing things. That refrigerator is a General Electric that was produced in the year I was born, 1946. Found it on the back of the refrigerator. Somebody gave it to me. And one of the great things about an old fridge like this, besides the fact you can generally get one free, is that it's not, it's not frost free. Frost free are the modern refrigerators which circulate air through the refrigerator to get moisture out so you don't get condensation and your, your, uh, your icebox portion of it doesn't frost up and get uh, that you have to then defrost. But if you can get one of these, you're in good shape because you can keep the right mice and rats out 
and keep it at a reasonable temperature just in the room. Now, if you don't have a cool place, let's say you've got a, a modern house with a heated basement, your furnace is there, what can you do? You can think about a garage, depending on how cold it gets. You don't want to freeze your, your vegetables uh, when you're storing them. You can think about the bulkhead. And depending whether your bulkhead is just a steel bulkhead or whether you've got uh, insulation on the inside and how it's attached to your basement. No, you'd have to put a thermometer in there this winter. This would be a good time to get a thermometer in your bulkhead if you want to store food there next year. I love these thermometers that have indoor outdoor uh, sensors so that you can put a, a sensor in the bulkhead and be in the kitchen and look and say, oh, okay, it's 42 down there. Uh oh, it's getting down to 32. We better do something. This is a simple cold box. Uh, whoops. Uh, you can see it's made out of cement blocks and it's two cement blocks high and three wide or two and a half wide. And that's it's, it's high enough that you can put a five gallon, most five gallon pails will fit in there nicely. And you can see potatoes in, in there being stored. And that's a piece of plywood, which is the lid. Now plywood, if you use half inch ply, tends to warp a little bit. And mice are very good at getting through crevices. So what I usually do is put an extra cement block or two to keep the, uh, the plywood, for, if it starts to warp, to keep it tight against the cement blocks. Um, in one that I built, I used a mortar in here between at the joints. Again, trying to make sure that mice don't get through. They can really compress themselves. For years, I did not have any heat in my basement. It would get well below freezing, down in the 20s. So in this um, coal box that I built, I did two different ways of, of adding a little warmth when that sensor tells me it's getting too cold. Uh, for years, I just used a 60 watt bulb on a drop light and the heat from that would keep it above freezing. Then I realized that that's not a very efficient way to do it. So I got a seed starting mat one of those black mats that you put underneath uh, trays to warm your seedlings so they'll germinate quickly. And again, that worked very simply, very easily, and that's a, it's less electricity being used. So that's something that pretty much anybody can build. You don't have to be a, a mason to do it. When you're thinking about having lots of food for the winter, think outside the box. So. If you were live and I could see you all, I'd say, raise your hand if you uh, grow rutabagas, if you've ever grown a rutabaga. And, and three of you would say, oh yeah, I've, I grow, and usually it would be three elderly people. People my age or older would say, oh yeah, we used to eat rutabagas way back when. Uh, you see the measuring tape there, that's a good six inches of food by three inches across. They store tremendously well and you can just substitute them for potatoes. They're not, rutabagas are not like turnips. Turnips have a distinct turnip flavor, whereas a rutabaga is sort of a neutral flavor like a potato. So when, if I'm making a beef stew, I will often substitute a rut, rutabagas cut up in chunks for potatoes in part because they don't get soggy. A potato, in a, in a, when you heat up a beef stew, you make a big beef stew and you eat it all week. Well, by the end, the potatoes have all fallen apart but the rutabagas will be in nice tight chunks. Uh, celeriac is another lesser known uh, root crop. This, this guy here and there, this is, I've cut the roots off of that and, and here I haven't. Um, it tastes just like celery, it's related to celery. The tops look like celery, but it grows this funny bulbous rooted area and it will last for six to eight months. It's just an amazing keeper. You just put it in the fridge anywhere. It doesn't even have to be in the vegetable drawer and it will keep just fine. So what I do is I cut off those roots before I put it away, wash it. And then when I want to use it, I'll just take a big knife and I'll take a couple of slices right across, starting at the bottom, slicing sideways, boom, 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 boom. And I can just take one or two slices, use that in a super stew for my celery flavor. And I... The reason I use celeriac rather than celery is that celery is hard for me to grow. 
celery tends to attract uh, slugs, snails. Uh, whenever I grew it, it would be tough and chewy and just never got big like store celery. Of course, each, each soil, each garden with its particular soil conditions and light conditions and so forth has its own favorites of, of things that, that you can grow well in your garden. So anything in the onion family for me is a winner. Leeks, I grow tons of leeks and you see some leeks down here at the bottom. Um, they're great for storage. You just can freeze them without doing anything to them. Just clean them up, cut off the roots, cut off the green parts, slice them down the middle, chop them, put them in a Ziploc bag and they will be just the way, the way they would be fresh when you want to use it in cooking. They're wonderful. Kohlrabis are also wonderful. Uh, Gigante uh, is one of the green ones over here that um, is a long keeper. By long keeper, we're talking eight or nine months in a refrigerator. Uh, you can, um, the little purple one here, I tend to eat fresh. Uh, I wrote an article in December saying, I, I was digging around in my refrigerator at that time and found a couple of purple kohlrabis. And uh, I had been ignoring them because I had picked them back in the end of summer. And I'm thinking, ah, these aren't gonna be that interesting. They were great. I found that I would eat them fresh, just you know, cut off these leaf stems and, and peel it, chop it up, put it in a stir fry or a stew, but it's also just good for snacking. Um, it's in the broccoli family and it tastes good. So if you're going to grow things to eat something every day, diversify, get lots of different flavors and it'll make you happy. Um, parsnips, they store all, very well all winter in the ground. That being said, it depends on what you have for mice and voles in your garden. Uh, because some root crops left in the ground, carrots in particular, will get eaten by, by rodents. Um, I haven't found that to be so much the case with parsnips. So I eat my parsnips, I'll occasionally have one in the fall or two in the fall, but I generally plant it as a spring crop. It's one of the first things I do in April. The first things I eat um, would be parsnips. I also have sorrel, which is a green, a perennial green that I grow in the garden. And that comes up and is ready to start picking. It's a lemon flavored uh, green that's a perennial. And that and my parsnips are the first things I eat from my garden. Then comes the, the rhubarb. And, and then after that, I'll get some lettuces that self sow. I always leave some lettuces in the garden to flower and drop their seeds in the ground, knowing that they'll start growing long before I would think of tilling the soil with uh, my little hand uh, hoe and uh, planting something because it's still so cold out, but the ones that are self-sown seem to do just fine. Here's another type of cold cellar. This was uh, Neil Sargent, who was a great gardener in Claremont, New Hampshire. I had a friend build this one and it's in the corner of a basement against the foundation. You can see this fan up here, which sucks in exterior air to keep things fresh. So she can turn that on and off. I think she's got a timer there to, to get some fresh air in there, depending on the season. All right, then what about things that want low humidity? They want a dry place. My first winter growing things, I, I grew these beautiful Blue Hubbard squash. I was in my 20s. And um, I put them down in the basement and said, oh, these are winter keepers. Well, I went down there around Christmas and they'd rotted because it was a high humidity basement. They want low humidity. I interviewed a Vermont farmer once who said, I, uh, you gotta keep your squashes upstairs. Put them under the bed in a spare bedroom with the door closed. And uh, it works well. You don't have to put them under the bed. That may not be convenient, but it is a good place to store stuff if you have a guest room and uh, you keep it cool. So 50 degrees or thereabouts. But the main thing is the, the main part of our houses during the winter is dry. So that's where you wanna keep your, your winter squash. Of the various winter squashes, Blue Hubbard is the best keeper. I've kept one for a, 
for 12 months once and I opened, I cracked it open with an ax and uh, cooked it and it was fabulous. Now, some people would say, well, the energy of a vegetable goes down with time. And there, there may be something to that. So probably the sooner you eat your vegetables, and this goes for things that you freeze as well, the sooner you eat them, the better in terms of what vitamins, minerals, and if there is vegetable energy in there, uh, better to eat them within a year. I did this last week. We've got a new dog, wonderful dog named Rowan, who was an Irish setter was his dad and a golden retriever was his mom. He's, he's about a year and a half old. We just got him three months ago. And um, I was looking for some vegetables to add to his food. And I found a package of frozen green beans or beautiful French filet beans. They were dated 2012. <laughs> they had been in my freezer for 10 years, but he didn't care. He scoffed them right up. I cooked them up and he enjoyed them. Um, garlic is something that I do eat pretty much every day because I, I don't, I very rarely buy any food that's prepared by, you know, a frozen dinner. I've never had bought a frozen dinner. I don't, yeah, I, I, I start everything from scratch. And most things from scratch do better with garlic. So garlic is a great crop. You plant it in the summer, in the late, you, you plant it in October and harvest it in July or August when the scapes are starting to dry up a little bit. And if you keep it in a low humidity area at 50 degrees or cooler, it will last for a long time. If it gets warmer, you'll see it start to sprout. And when you see it start to sprout, eat it up faster. Onions are great for keep great keepers. I like the Patterson onion. That's the name of the variety that I, I've been growing the last few years. Um, I've had other brands, but the seed companies are fickle. That you'll, you'll find a, an onion you really love and you'll grow it for a few years and all of a sudden it's no longer on the market. But uh, Patterson is a yellow keeper. And um, let me show you what I, Here's a, an orchard, what's called an orchard rack um, that I got from Gardener Supply. They have a store in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and they're also up in uh, Winooski or, or Burlington. Um, it's a wooden rack. You can see there are onions there. I have these rows, that's, that's all garlic. You can see I've got some winter squash there. Who knows what I've got down below, but it's uh, right next, this is the glass door is going to the outside. Through, or they were going to a, to a mud room, which is unheated, and then to the outside front door. So this, this door is a cold door, and I got this close to it to keep the temperature uh, cooler. Uh, it still gets to be in the 50s, and I wish it were a little bit cooler. I could put it out there with the, where the coats are, but then when it gets to be days like today, when it's sub-zero at night, uh, that would be too cold. Again, you don't want to freeze anything. Then there are things that need to stay warm. This is a crop of sweet potatoes I grew a few years ago, and I've had mixed luck with sweet potatoes. They need a lot of heat. I don't normally use black plastic, but I'm talking to a professional farmers. They've all told me you've got to put plastic over your sets when you, when you plant them, your slips, and you've got to have lots of water. So this line here is an irrigation line. It's a drip line. And I'm harvesting there. And one 35-foot row that year, I got over 60 pounds of sweet potatoes. So there were plenty to share. But never put your sweet potatoes in a cold basement or never put them in the fridge. Even if you buy them at the store, don't put them in the fridge. They like it warm. All right, now we're going to talk about freezing. We've finished with storing. Uh, these are blanching pots. This is a standard canning container. Uh, and this is a, a blanching pot that fits inside that because of the perspective of the camera. This looks bigger than that, but it fits inside it. This is the insides of that one, which, which came as, as a unit with a lid. So what is blanching? Blanching is taking your vegetables and immersing them 
in boiling water briefly, underlined briefly, 30 to 60 seconds. Why are we doing this? To kill the enzymes that are the aging enzymes. So if you've got broccoli, that's fresh broccoli, it will become elderly broccoli if you leave it in your fridge too long and then you won't want to eat it. If you freeze it in a Ziploc bag, it'll be good for three months. But if you wait six months or a year, you won't want to eat it either because it'll be dried out and nasty and elderly. Sounds like I'm an age discriminationist here, but I'm not really. Um, you just have to um, kill those enzymes. So when I first read about it in a wonderful book, they said, oh, you want to you freeze your squash or your broccoli? drop in boiling water for three minutes. Well, of course, three minutes in boiling water is fully cooking it. And you don't want that. I want broccoli that's still crunchy when I eat it out of the freezer. I want zucchini that tastes like zucchini and has zucchini texture. So if I'm going to cook up some, some zucchini for freezing, it will be 30 seconds. I would wash the zucchini, cut it into half inch cubes, get the pot, let's say we're doing the smaller pot, we get that to a uh, rolling boil with this pot in it. And then I would have a colander with about uh, hmm, three or four quarts of chopped up zucchini. And I drop it in here and it may not even come back to a, to a, to a full boil. Some people put this on the work counter and fill, put some zucchini in it and then drop it into the, to this. But I want this to, everything to be as hot as possible so that it's a flash uh, process. You, you're just quickly blanching it. If you're doing something like Brussels sprouts, which is um, much denser and tougher than a zucchini or, or a broccoli, or um, you want to, blanch it for a full minute. With something like kale, and I do a lot of kale, kale is fine for, again, for up to three months, just putting it, you know, washing it, drying it, putting it in Ziploc bags uh, and freezing it. But I eat kale in, in smoothies much of the year, frozen kale, and um, I use it in stir fries and stews. One of the great things about kale is that even after you've blanched it and frozen it, it still is kale. You know, it's, it's still got plenty of crunch to it. But with something like kale, I'll look at the color. When the color of green changes, then I know it's been in the boiling water long enough. Um, so things that need to be blanched, beans, beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, cauliflower, corn, kale, peaches, spinach, squash, and Swiss chard. That's a lot of different vegetables and they all need some kind of blanching if you're gonna use them for over the period of a year or even two years. They're still fine even at three years. Those 12 year old, 10 year old beans, I wasn't so impressed with, but... Um, uh, you just have to experiment and see what works. And some things like carrots, you don't even have to freeze because they keep so well in, in a, if you've got a cold place or in the vegetable drawer of your refrigerator or in your garage, depending on what, how cold your garage gets. Okay, so what do we do with tomatoes? You notice they were not on the blanching list. Here are some interesting tomatoes of various sizes, shapes, and colors. I freeze them whole, unblanched. And most of these that you're looking at are actually heirloom tomatoes that will get eaten up and they would never get in the freezer. But, you know, standard, what I call red rocks, and that's not a fully ripe tomato there. That, that wouldn't be a good, let's say that one right there. I just take that stem off, I wash it, dry it, and then I put usually in a one quart Ziploc bag, I can fit either nine or 12 tomatoes, depending on the size. 
put three across and you get either three or four rows. Um, let's see, what do I have? Yes, okay. You see, there they are in the Ziploc bags. And what I do is I try to suck the air out of them. Do I have a picture of this? Yes, see, this is a drinking straw and it slides into the bag and I've zipped it up right to there. And while I'm holding it, I put my finger over the straw. I'll suck it out until they, these uh, tomatoes are have the plastic right up against them. And then I'll finish, I'll yank out the straw and snap shut the bag. So you don't need one of those fancy machines that they sell uh, to, to vacuum seal your, your vegetables. You can just take Ziploc bags and do that. Um, I just want to make a note that you should always label the year that you plant it, uh, that you plant it, that you freeze it, and you indicate what it is. Because later on, when things have frosted up a bit, it's hard to tell the difference between zucchini and leeks. And if you're making a zucchini and tomato soup in the middle of January and you come up with uh, um, leeks instead of zucchini, you won't be happy when it's time for dinner. So label them and always use freezer grade bags. Yes, it's a little cheaper to buy the storage bags, but they're thinner and their zippers aren't as good. So get good quality bags. It's, it's, and you can, I reuse these bags later on for other things, but I don't uh, freeze anything in them again. Now here's another thing that I do, which I just love doing. I make tomato paste and what I mainly with uh do I have any pictures no I don't um imperfect tomatoes I cut the imperfections out and I'll I'll, I'll use them for making paste and, I, and I'll use good tomatoes for paste too but uh what I do is I'll take a paring knife and I'll cut out the core and squeeze out as much juice as I can and that will also get the seeds out you don't have to do that. Um, what my next step is to put, is to put them in a in a blender. I, I'll cut the tomato. If it's a big tomato, I'll cut it in quarters. I'll throw it in the blender, uh, and I fill the blender halfway up, and then I'll puree it in the blender until it's just a mush. And then I have a big, heavy iron pot that's enameled, a Le Creuset French pot, which is a wonderful thing to cook with but terribly expensive. I've had mine for ages. Uh, and I'll have it on a slow cook. And I will do 20 pounds of tomatoes at a time, perhaps, to fill up my biggest French cooking pot. And then I will let that simmer very gently as I'm working on, you know, I'll start with, a, with a, one blender full of tomatoes. I'll put that on, put the heat on, and then I'll, I'll do that 20 times, which takes me an hour or two to prepare it all, but it's still all cooking. And I let it keep on simmering till bedtime. If I start right after dinner at seven o'clock by 10 o'clock, it's, it's cooked down. I know what's ready when I can stand up a soup spoon in the pot. If it does, if it, if it falls over, it's still too thin. You want a, a thick consistency. And then I leave it out overnight with no lid on it. And that allows it because it's hot, it'll evaporate some more. And in the morning, each of these, uh, these little cells is one heaping tablespoon, which is wonderful. I made a, a dish last night and it asked for a tablespoon or maybe it's two tablespoons, I forget. I think it's one. Anyway, um, it asked for one tablespoon of tomato paste. Now, if I were working from my pantry, I would have had to open a can of tomato paste. And then you know what? Some weeks later, I'd find in the back of the fridge growing blue and green fuzzies. So uh, this, I keep, I keep a Ziploc bag in my refrigerator freezer, you know, right there in the kitchen, not because I have, I have a lot of freezers. But most of them are not handy. Well, I actually now I'm down to two big freezers. 
but they're not right in the kitchen. So anyway, it's good to have some tomato paste in the kitchen in a Ziploc bag that you can just pull one out and use it. And it doesn't go fuzzy on you. I use the whole thing. I love tomatoes. Tomatoes to me are the queen of the garden. And um, you can roast them until they're caramelized and have lost much of their water and then freeze them. Then you can take a few out, put them in a toaster oven and put in a winter sandwich. To me, a sandwich is nothing without tomatoes. Or you can put them into a soup or a stew or even a salad. But roasting tomatoes is another, it takes time. It's a long time to, and there are different theories. Some people say roast them at a low temperature, some ro roast them at 350. I'm sure there are people that roast them at higher temperatures, but you can just experiment. All right, dehydrating. I have tried all the different dehydrators that I could think of. This is Nesco American Harvest. This is the uh, top here, which sits on top of the stack of those trays and it forces hot air down through the rack drying the, the, the fruit or vegetable. They also have one with the heaters at the bottom and then the heat comes up, which I think is much more efficient. Pushing hot air down is not what it wants to do. It's nice because over here you can set a timer for how many hours you want it to do it. And so you can set it at, if you do it in the afternoon and you want it to turn off after 12 hours, it's in the middle of the night. But this, you just set it for 12 hours and it turns off. Um, we can also set the temperature. I like to dehydrate tomatoes. When I first put them in, and I dehydrate a lot of these cherry tomatoes, I cut them in half and put cut side down. Um, I start them at 145 or 150 for an hour. Then I drop the temperature down to, or even half an hour. Then I'll drop the temperature down to 130. I don't want to keep the temperature up too high for too long because I don't want to lose vitamin C, which tends to degrade, and some other vitamins. Then this is the Excalibur. This is about uh, two thirds the energy use. That's 660 watts an hour. That one is 1,000 watts an hour. But I run these things often 24 hours a day for, for a few weeks when I'm, when I'm doing all my food processing. I process tomatoes, hot peppers, apples, pears, and I've experimented with lots of things. So here are some pears on a, on a tray in the Excalibur. They're very good snackage. Apples you can, you can dry and, and you know, put in a bag in your pocket when you're going for a hike, they're great. So dehydrating is, is um, a wonderful way of going about it. Then there's fermenting. You can make sauerkraut. Start by growing cabbage. Get a proper crock and learn how to do it. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of making sauerkraut because I've decided I don't really like sauerkraut, so I don't do it anymore, but I have done it. Um, likewise, you can make vinegar. I've, I've done that. I'm not sure it's worth it because you're starting with um, apple juice, apple cider. I will say this, if you grow, if you have an apple tree and you have somebody in your vicinity that will make cider for you, it's a great way, it's a great winter product. So what I do is I, I'll go with say five bushels of apples, bring it to my guy, I'll pay him, I don't know, a dollar and a half maybe for him to, for each half gallon to press them, my apples, and put them into uh, cider jugs and leave an inch and a half or two inches at the top so that when they freeze, they don't pop the corks, they don't pop the plastic caps. And uh, the half gallon cider jugs just fit on the door of most freezers. They, they're, they're, they're terrific that way. So I like to have my own cider that I can drink all year and uh, just go downstairs and it takes a day to thaw it, but it's great. Um, this is a jelly cone. This is like a colander, but with much smaller holes. That's a wooden pestle that you push in there. Uh, I use it for raspberries, elderberries, um, 
and other things. So those are the basic techniques I use for growing things. Here's a friend that has a, uh, a vegetable truck. I ended up getting one of these from Gardner Supply because they're so slick. If you look, this is 16 inches deep. See, it's a V-shaped bed you know, with slats down there. It's made out of cedar and it's got a, a, cloth, a synthetic cloth lining so that the dirt doesn't go through. My vegetable garden is quite a distance from my house and it's down about a 25 foot elevation drop from my kitchen down to where my vegetables grow. So if you go run down to the garden, run back up, and you do that many times a day, it's handy to have herbs and spices growing right near the, the kitchen door. So these things are good. Um, here's that 10 by 12 foot garden that I was uh, showing you the pictures of earlier in the, in the uh, presentation. Um, a standard lawn has a very low content of organic matter. So I worked in lots of composted cow manure or bags of moodoo in this case, because uh, it was for somebody else and they didn't have any compost. Um, but you can grow a heck of a lot in two beds like that. That's 12 feet long with two big wide beds. Each of these beds is about 30 inches across. I was gonna do a book about how to, what you can grow on your lawn, but I never found a publisher for it because I was pitching in 2008 when we happened to be having an economic downturn. But you can see here's a tomato cage with little lettuces around it. Then later on in the season, you can see things, so those lettuces are bigger, the tomatoes are bigger. Here's a few things we picked one day from the garden. And um, you know, those potatoes could go in the vegetable drawer and last for a long time before they get used. These squashes could be cut up and uh, frozen or used locally, I mean, um, immediately. Um, here's my grandson, George, when he was uh, a little guy, I wanted him to have his own garden. So you see these, these metal brackets on the corners. It's a very simple one by six. Uh, they're available. I got those from Lee Valley Tool, but I think that Gardener Supply probably sells them. You don't have to dig up the lawn. You can just put down newspapers and then put your, your soil mix right in there. And he had great fun with that. And you can have a little, even if you're 85 years old and, and have an arthritic elbow, you can get somebody to build you one of these. You can grow some nice little vegetables. There's George with his carrots a different year, but he loved growing carrots. Um, here in the garden, there are my potatoes. I use a post hole digger for planting potatoes. It's a lot easier than digging holes. Just a few tricks here. Peppers and eggplants need lots of heat. That's a black rock sitting next to it because it'll heat up from the sun all day and it'll kick back uh, heat during the night. Even a few degrees makes a difference. So if you wanna eat from the garden all, all year, you've gotta use, you've gotta learn. You gotta pay attention to what works, what doesn't work. Here's my garden helper, Sister Margaret, and uh, she keeps the birds out. And that's about it. Uh, there's my website. There's some of the books I've written. And uh, this one, Organic Gardening, Not Just in the North East, a hands-on month-by-month guide is available for $19 from me at that address. Or if you go to my website, you can click on store and you can get it through PayPal, but somehow I can't seem to change it from $21 to $19 when I, when I did the promotion for Christmas. So if you use PayPal, you're gonna pay two bucks more, I'm sorry. So uh, I'm ready to take questions now. And I, I would also just mention that if you're within about 60 miles of, of Cornish, you know, I do consultations. I'm willing to come to your house and talk to you for an hour and a half and um, help you both in a vegetable garden or in a flower garden. And I've been, I've been gardening for over 70 years, uh, starting when I was a little, little rascal with my grandfather. And uh, I've learned a few things and I, I love to share them. And uh, you can also just email me. My email, I didn't put up there, but it's henry.homeyer at comcast.net. And um, send me a question. If, if you don't get your question answered today or if this summer you're having trouble with something, don't hesitate, send me an email. I'm glad, I'm glad to share my knowledge. So now let's take some questions. 
Great, thank you. We have quite a few to get through. Um, but first, I put the link um, to your website in the chat for people. Um, and also, your contact information and website are in the program guide so people can access it there as well. Um, all right, let's see. So back to the beginning of your presentation, there are some questions. Um, does the old refrigerator get plugged in? Um, and how much electrical power is it using? Those are great questions. Um, I don't plug my refrigerator in. It's really to keep the mice out. And my basement is a cold basement. If you've got a hot basement, then you got to plug it in and put it down at its very lowest setting, you know, the, the warmest setting. So it should only come on. The great thing about old refrigerators is they really insulated them well. Um, I had a different old refrigerator at one point. Uh, up in the kitchen and it only ran for a, a few minutes every day because it, it had walls that were three inches thick with insulation so the energy use is very low i haven't calculated it but in the winter because i've got a cold place i don't plug it in but great question thanks okay great and um do you mind if we stop sharing your screen so we can see you when oh, you're speaking sure or i can oh there we go Excellent, thank you. Um, next question, uh, when do you seed your parsnips for overwintering, Jean is wondering. Um, parsnips like, they, they won't germinate in cold soil. They, they go through the winters great, but I plant them in June, June 10th at 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> or thereabouts. Okay, awesome. Um, do you save your Hubbard seeds? Uh, I could, and I have, but many times I just forget to do it. Um, I like to save seeds. It, it will breed true. They're not a hybrid. The only seeds that you can't save are hybrid tomatoes, hybrid squash, hybrid anything. It's not going to breed true, but um, something like a blue Hubbard is uh, fine. Yep. Okay, great. Um... What type pumpkin, of pumpkins oh. hybridize like crazy? So, okay. and I guess actually, when I want to think about it, but squashes will hybridize too. If you're growing blue hubbards as blue hubbards, but you're growing them next to your pumpkins, they may, the seeds may have pollen from, may have used pollen from a pumpkin or a, a summer squash. No, don't say, don't say, uh, now that I think about it, don't save your, your squash seeds at all because they're very promiscuous. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, what type of sweet potato do you like to grow? Uh, there's one that's recommended for colder climates and uh, it's not on the top of my brain because I haven't grown any for a number of years. But if you look in the Johnny's Selected Seed Catalog, they tell you everything there. It'll tell you which one's good for cold climates. Okay. And they're online. You can just go to johnnies.com. Okay. And they are a sponsor of this conference. So you can also find their website from our sponsors page. <laughs> um, all right, Ben asks, are there, do any other vegetables like warm storage besides sweet potatoes? There probably are, but I can't think of any. And I just wanna go back to the sweet potatoes. You're actually not planting seeds for sweet potatoes. You buy slips or little green shoots that you plant. They come in a little packet of, of either 12 or 25 or 100, whatever. Okay. Great. Um, how many refrigerators and or freezers are you running throughout the year? Uh, right now, I've got two refrigerators, the, the one in the kitchen and then a, a storage refrigerator in the basement. And I have two full-size refrigerators, a... Um, big standing you know front opening one that i like the best because i can really see what's in it and then uh, cindy had one my wife had one when um that moved over here when we got married and um it uh is a chest type which is more efficient temperature wise and energy wise but it's very easy to lose stuff down at the bottom. You really have to know what's there. If you have somebody that can make a list and cross it off when you take out a package of something, I'm not that guy. I go to see what's in the freezer and I'll make dinner with what I pull out. <laughs> so I have two of each and um, 
And that does, that does two people quite well. Great. Um, what's your feeling about freeze-dried, freeze-drying? Uh, there are now machines that are available for home gardeners to freeze-dry. I've never had one because they're tremendously expensive. I think they do pretty good quality from everything I know about them. They work really well, but I just don't have that kind of money. Okay, thank you. Um, what cabbage varieties do you grow? And same question for potatoes as well. Uh, potatoes are easier to answer. I love the red Pontiac potato. I love um, any of the yellow potatoes. Yukon Gold, for example, is a good one. Uh, Magic Molly is a purple one. And it's the only purple one I know that will grow full size purple potatoes that are purple all the way through, not just purple on the skin, but purple all the way through and get to be a big potato. Just one quick note about potatoes. You've got to grow them with as much sunshine as you can. Trees have grown up around my garden and some of my areas only get four or five hours of sunshine now. Um, but you really need six hours or more for growing potatoes and they'd really like to have 12 hours. So if you want to specialize in potatoes, dig up your front lawn because that's where the sun is. And what was a cabbage? Um, I haven't grown cabbage much recently. Um, but uh, I like the purple cabbages and I like the Savoy cabbage. I've, I've read that purple cabbages are less prone to cabbage loopers and cabbage bugs. Uh, but uh, I don't have a specific name of one that I, I like so much. Okay, great, thank you. Um, ben asked if you can recommend a good resource for how much to grow of each vegetable for a family. Doesn't say what, what the size family is. Well, I'll have to write an article about that for my newspapers in mm -hmm. April. That's a, it's a great question. Um, I would say that a family of four, if you had a, a garden space that was 20 by 20, you could grow a heck of a lot of vegetables that would make your happy your, your family quite happy. I grow a lot more than that because I'm putting up so much and because I'm always trying new things mm -hmm. or, or trying something again. So, you know, I, I might only grow sweet potatoes every five years. Some years I have great luck. Other years I don't. I try to figure out why. But it may, mainly in my garden, a lot of it has to do with where it's located in terms of sunshine, because my soil is fabulous. But uh, I can't tell you a, for, for each thing. I would say that the more cherry tomatoes, sun gold cherry tomatoes you grow, the, the happier you will be because they're great to eat like candy. They dehydrate well. You can put them in a Ziploc and freeze them. You can put them in salads, soup, stir fries. I can't say enough about it, but I also want some slicing tomatoes. You know, I do 40 to 50 tomato plants a year. Most people don't want that many. Um, I do nine to 12 cherry tomato plants. But again, it's, I also like to give stuff away. So at Christmas time, I'll give, a, I might give to a loved one, a, a Ziploc bag full of, of frozen cherry, to, uh, not frozen, um, dehydrated cherry tomatoes. And that's a great gift. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, Susan asked uh, if you have advice for putting raised beds over septic. Top considerations for that. Interesting question. The general rule of thumb is not to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally don't see that your roots are going to go down to where your septic is and that's you know i know that you you know it's strictly verboten to plant trees on it and i don't wouldn't plant i have a project in hanover i've been working on and it, we're mainly planting trees but also doing wildflowers and i uh know that some of the wildflowers that i don't use over it have long tap roots um so you don't want to mess up the, the septic system and but if you want to grow lettuce there, it would probably be fine. Uh, but I don't really know. I think that deserves some research. 
Thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about jumping worms and uh, planting with them? Any special considerations um, for dealing with them? Well, uh, yes, I, I wrote an article about jumping worms uh, last fall. And if you Google Henry Homeyer and jumping worms, you'll that, that'll come up on your screen, uh, I'm sure. But briefly, they're terrifying. They, uh, they're getting into people's gardens everywhere and they're eating the organic matter and their castings, their poop, uh, is not, does not make the minerals available the way, you know, common earthworms, the, their castings are actually sold as a, as a fertilizer in small quantities and quite expensively. Um, but this is a real hardened mass that doesn't become readily available. They, they're voracious eaters. They all die in the fall when the cold weather comes, but their castings uh, live on and set the new, new generation. They travel. Uh, I just attended a, a workshop virtually about uh, jumping worms. And when I was out of the room, apparently they talked about ways of uh, controlling them. And one of the things they mentioned, according to Cindy, who was watching it, my wife, she said that biochar may be, uh, has been shown to have some ability to uh, kill the, uh, the eggs that are over, that have overwintered. So um, I'm going to look into that and see what we can do. But I think I have one bed now that has the jumping worms and I'm definitely gonna put down some biochar and see if I can learn something about how it, how it works. Great, thank you. Um, and do you have any problems with cabbage loopers? I don't, but I don't grow a lot of cabbages. And um, uh, I found that when I do cabbages, I cover them with uh, reme or row cover to, to physically keep the, uh, the, the cabbage loopers off the cabbages. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I think that we've covered all the questions. This well, perfect, we're just about out of time. Yes, it's good timing. Um, do you want to add anything else before we wrap up? Um, well, just that, as I said, I'm. if you're within 60 miles or so of me, you can hire me to come down and help you with your garden and, you know, look at it, talk to you, give you ideas, both in the flower garden and in the, in the vegetable garden. And uh, my books are available through my website or, you know, mailing a check to me directly for the book that I mentioned, which is a collection of my newspaper and magazine stories collected over a 10 year period. And it's a month by month thing. What am I doing in the garden in, in, in April? And what am I doing in July? And interviews with interesting gardeners from Tasha Tudor to Ray Mariazzi from Car Talk. It's got a lot of fun stuff in it. You don't have to read it all at once. Cool. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, great. So I'm gonna pop some links in the chat here for everyone. Um, and this concludes our workshop. Henry, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and thank pleasure. you everyone for being here. Um, so we hope you'll join us for the next session, which is creating a sustainable food economy for a more resilient community with April Jones. Um, that's at three o'clock. Um, and in the meantime, check out our virtual exhibitor fair with 17 different exhibitors, including our conference bookstore, hosted by Main Street Bookends. Um, and when you order books through Main Street Bookends and include NOFA NH in the comments, 20% of proceeds will be donated back to NOFA New Hampshire. Um, please also mark your calendars for our upcoming programs. Uh, on February 17th, we have NOFA New Hampshire's Farm Bill listening session. Um, and then we have our Feeding the Family Organic Gardening series, uh, which is six workshops running from February 22nd to May 3rd. 
Um, and finally, our bulk order program. Um, you can save on farming and gardening supplies by ordering through our bulk order store. Um, the deadline to order is February 28th, and then you pick up everything on March 19th and 20th in Andover, New Hampshire, Ware, and Rochester. And that's all. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Henry.